We've been going through a series called Cover to Cover, Seeing Jesus in All of the Bible. And this would be the fourth installment of that. And we've been looking at a number of the types in the Bible of the characters that are really types of Christ. Uh, all of the Bible, New and Old Testament, is teaching us about Jesus. And the stories in the Bible and these great characters in the Bible are often giving us insights into the plan of salvation and the life and the ministry of Jesus. There probably is no character in the Old Testament that is a more vivid example of Christ than that of Joseph. Now, we were introduced last week to Joseph, and when we left the story, he was beginning a time of great trial, and he had been sold as a slave. You know, the Bible promises that God can give us courage through our trials. We all go through different trials. Typically, any trial that you may go through in life, God is going to use it to reach you, and he's going to use it to reach others through you. And so it ends up being a blessing. It may not feel like it at the time. thought I'd just share a little amazing fact from history regarding courage through trials. Early trials and setbacks don't have to define your life. Consider for a minute Abraham Lincoln. His mother died when he was nine years old. His father could not read. He failed in business at age 21. He was defeated in a legislative race at the age of 22. He failed again in business at the age of 24. Overcome by the death of his sweetheart at age 26, he had a nervous breakdown at age 27 lost a congressional race at age 34. He married a wife who struggled with severe depression and later mental illness. He lost a congressional race at the age of 36. Lost the senatorial race at the age of 45. He failed in an effort to become vice president at the age of 47. Lost another senatorial race at the age of 47. And from the ashes of those failures, he went on to be elected president of the United States at age 52 and he liberated four million slaves and saved the Union. You know, sometimes you think, oh, I've just failed so many times. But uh, God may be just pre preparing you for a great work and a great success and a great ministry. And, and we see that will end up happening in the life of Joseph. Now, just a little review, because uh, some maybe haven't read it or you weren't here last week. Joseph was the firstborn son of Jacob's wife, Rachel, but he was not the firstborn son. But Jacob loved Joseph more than all his children because he only wanted one wife, and that was Rachel, beautiful Rachel. Uh, Rachel must have also been a very good woman in many ways because her early training for Joseph, she died in childbirth for Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin, but that early training must have been something extraordinary because Joseph grew up to be an extraordinary man with great scruples. But uh, Jacob, when uh, Reuben was misbehaving, Reu Reuben had a, an affair with uh, Jacob's, one of his concubines, and he said Reuben, who was technically the firstborn, could not have the right of the firstborn. He gave Joseph this beautiful coat of many colors, and that made the other brothers jealous. We learned those coats of many colors were given to royalty. I read you a few verses on that last week. Furthermore, those coats were also for the priestly office. For kings and priests wore these robes of beautiful colors. Let me read you a few verses on that. Exodus 28, verse 2. And you will make holy garments for Aaron and his brother, for glory and for beauty. And verse uh, 6, it says, And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet yarns, of fine twine linen, skillfully worked. And it says they were embroidered. So when you think of the robe of many colors, please delete the picture that you've got in your mind of Joseph wearing a rainbow robe. It was probably a little more like the embroidery that you see with the kings and the priests that are described here. But the rest of the family understood that meant Joseph was going to get the blessing of the firstborn, even though he was the second to the youngest. Though he was the firstborn of Rachel. So they were just so angry. And then he started having dreams visions of grandeur, that he was going to be a great ruler and that they would all end up bowing down to him. And he didn't mean to make him angry. He was just so impressed that God had a great destiny for him. He had to share it with someone. 
And that made them even more enraged. And the Bible says three times in chapter 37, they hated him, they hated him, they hated him even more. So when the father sent Joseph to find out where his brothers were grazing the sheep, he is sent of the father looking for his lost brothers, like Jesus. They see him coming. They say, here comes this dreamer. Let's murder him and throw him in a hole and say some evil beast has devoured him. And Reuben stopped them from their purpose and said, he's your brother. Don't take his blood. Just throw him in the cistern. Throw him in the, in the empty well. And Joseph came. They stripped him of his coat. They threw him in a pit where there was no water. Then they sat down to eat. And then Judah saw a caravan of Ishmaelite traders carrying balm and myrrh down to Egypt. And he said, uh, hey, why not, make, why not make a little money? So let's sell him as a slave and get him out of town. And uh, no one will ever hear from him again in Egypt. They didn't have the internet back then or Facebook, so they figured he'd just disappear in obscurity. So they sold Joseph for the price of a slave for 20 pieces of silver. The Ishmaelites probably took him to Egypt and then sold him for 30 to make a profit. So here you have Joseph being sold by one of the 12, as Jesus was sold by one of the 12, for the price of a slave, for silver, by Judas, and Judas is the Greek way of saying Judah. And Jesus, when he was young, some wise men came bearing balm and myrrh, and that was the money that was used by his father Joseph to take him to Egypt. There's so many analogies. So here's where we pick up our story. And, um, the, you know, the interesting thing is that Joseph is one of the few people in the Bible actually who gets a vision in advance telling about his destiny. Jeremiah, Samson, Mary, Paul, Joseph, visions were given saying God has a destiny for your future. Now, you may not have had a dream or vision, but I can tell you God has a purpose for your life. And you know, friends, this is very near and dear to my heart because I remember going through my early life wondering if there was any meaning to life, being raised pretty much an atheist or agnostic. And after I found the Lord, I was overcome by the truth that God has a will and a destiny, a providence for people's lives. And I never would have dreamed the way the Lord has led and worked in my life, and it was all His working and His providence. And so I just, uh, I praise him because sometimes God takes you through trials to prepare you for ministry. Amen. And this is what happens here with Joseph. So if you'll take your Bibles, you can turn to uh, the book of Genesis chapter 39. And we see that Joseph now goes from these trials to a phase of his life where he is a faithful servant. But before a faithful servant, he must have full surrender. As the Ishmaelite traders are bringing Joseph down to Egypt because he was looking for his brothers up in a, a northern area called Dothan, his father was bivouacked with the family and all the servants in a place called Hebron. The Ishmaelite traders are going to Egypt. It necessitated them going back by where the hills where Joseph could see his family. So can you imagine? Joseph's now been sold as a slave by his brothers treated terribly, mocked and abused. He pled for mercy. They showed him no mercy. He's now tied either on or behind a camel and being taken off to be sold as a slave where he had been the pampered son of a wealthy nomad. Joseph, or Israel rather was, Jacob, Israel, was very much like a king. Back then the kings were sheiks. They, were, they had these servants and wealth and tribes and, and uh, flocks and herds and and Joseph had been the crown prince, and now he's going to be sold as a slave. And he could look off in the distance and maybe even see the wisps of smoke coming up from the, the homestead, thinking his father, how he would have a broken heart that now his son didn't come home. He overheard his brother saying, we'll say an evil beast has devoured him. And he thought about how his father would grieve. Was Jesus aware of the grieving of our heavenly father? in the absence of his son. Joseph then made a resolution of full surrender. He said, all right, Lord, I believe you gave me those dreams, supernatural dreams, because you have a plan for my life. You'll find out later that Joseph not only has dreams, 
he has the ability to interpret dreams. You think he might have known something about his own dream if he can interpret other people's dreams. He knew God had a big plan for him. He said, Lord, whatever happens, I'm going to fully surrender and trust you. You know, friends, if you can get past that decision in your life, your life will be a lot happier. Whatever happens, you will do your best to serve God. You will do your best to be faithful. Whatever happens, you're going to trust the Lord. And do your best to represent Christ. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it unto the Lord. Whether you're a prisoner, whether you're a slave, do all things unto the Lord, wherever God puts you in life. You know, there's a quote I read actually uh, last night from that beautiful classic called Patriarchs and Prophets, series that deals with uh, the early days in the Bible and the Old Testament, talking about Joseph when he had been sold. It says, his soul thrilled with the high resolve to prove himself true to God under all circumstances to act as became a subject of the king of heaven. He would serve the Lord with undivided heart. He would meet with trials, his lot with fortitude, and perform every duty with fidelity. One day's experience had been the turning point in Joseph's life. Its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a man, thoughtful, courageous, self-possessed. He had a radical wake-up experience. You know, sometimes people say they had a come-to-Jesus experience. And Joseph, realizing that he was being sent off to Egypt, he said, all right, I'm going to be in totally foreign circumstances. The only one I know that is always with me is God. And he submitted himself to God. So he gets down to Egypt, and this is where you take it up with Genesis chapter 39, and he becomes the faithful servant here. And I'm just going to read the first few verses of this. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and there Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, that phrase captain of the guard appears several times in the passage. It makes it, uh, leads us believing from some of the, the ancient writings and commentators that he actually had the position of being chief of police, also chief of executioners. And um, so he has a powerful position. Now God deliberately puts Joseph in connection with, well, I guess I didn't finish, Potiphar buys him. Let me finish the verse here. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites whom had taken him there. And so um, the Lord in his design had Joseph placed, he's 17 years old. By the way, we can map out the life of Joseph pretty clearly. Some ages and dates are given. He's 17 years old. He's just on the cusp of manhood, old enough to be drafted, but still pretty young. And they take him to the auction block there in Egypt where the slaves are bought and sold. And he could have been bought by some potter, shoemaker, anything, but he's bought by somebody who is in connect, who's connected with the palace and the government and science and leaders. And that was part of God's design because Joseph got a crash course education. First, he had to learn the Egyptian language, which he evidently was very smart because he learned it pretty quick. You know, when you're young, you can do that. Have you ever noticed a family will come to the United States from some foreign country and they got like three kids? The kids are all speaking English in six months and 20 years later, the parents are still struggling? <laughs> You're laughing because it's true. Yeah, it's amazing to me. So Joseph, he quickly picks it up and he's taking in everything and he says, if I'm going to be a slave, I'm going to be a good slave. And you know, later there was a little girl who had been captured by the Syrians and sold into the house of a Syrian general named Naaman. And she read the story of Joseph. She said, well, if I'm going to be a slave, I'm going to be a good slave. And instead of overcoming evil with evil, I am going to seek the best interest of my masters. And so Joseph, he was faithful, he was good, he was honorable, he was kind, he was empathetic. It says, verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. Now you think that if you're going through a trial, God abandoned you. Sometimes you're going through a hard time, you think God's left me. Now God might be wanting you to go through a hard trial. You know, Jesus sometimes lets us go through a fiery furnace and he goes through it with us, amen? 
You may land in a lion's den, but the Lord goes to the lion's dens also. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. So yes, Joseph, he did go through some hard times, but four times in this chapter, I'll let you find them later, it says, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Even though it looks like things in his situation are going from bad to worse, the Lord was with him. That tells us for the Lord is with you. That's like north, south, east, west. Wherever you go, the Lord is with you. Jesus said, I am with you wherever you go, even to the end of the age. Amen? And he was a successful man. Now it's calling Joseph a man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So he's not just working out in the field. He's got responsibilities in the house. And his master saw the Lord was with him. And the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in, the sight, in his sight and served him. And he made him overseer of his house. And of all that he had, he put under his authority. Now this did not happen in one day. We're actually reading the span of about 10 years in this passage. He gets there, he learns the language, he's faithful in the little things, they give him more to do, he's faithful in that, they give him more. The master says, this is the sharpest young man, he's got a great attitude, and um, everything I give him, you know, there's some people that you give them something, they get it done. And, you know, they say, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. Because they're usually the ones that get things done. And Joseph was sharp, his father had taught him how to read, and so probably also learned now how to read hieroglyphics or whatever uh, the Egyptians had back then, and he's learning the math and the sciences, and I think he wanted to expand his education, talking to the other servants that worked in the palaces. The master would sometimes send Joseph off to the market on errands to buy things because he knew he could trust them, and in his interchange with the servants of other officials, he was asking questions, he's learning things, he's filling his mind, he wanted to learn all he could to prepare him for whatever God's destiny was. I think that's an important lesson that we should do all we can to learn all we can. You take your earthly education with you to heaven, you know. Education begins here, goes on through eternity. So he's learning. And says the master made him overseer of all, and he put it under his authority. So it was from the time that he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. His master also had some crops. That comes in handy. So Joseph learned something about farming too, didn't he? And all of Potiphar's fields uh, were put under Joseph's authority. So he learned about managing farms and managing fields. That was going to help save the world later. It was very important. And everything was blessed for Joseph's sake. Verse 6. And thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he didn't know what he had except for the bread that he ate. I want to pause right there. You know, the Bible tells us that if we receive any blessing, we are blessed for Jesus' sake. And you remember the blessing that God gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He said, in blessing I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. God repeats that blessing through Isaac to Jacob. And now we see it lived out in that the one who is good to Joseph is blessed. Two very important points here that I think you can see Jesus in it. First of all, it says that the Lord blessed for Joseph's sake. When we pray, do we pray that God blesses us for our sake? Or do we pray that God blesses us for Christ's sake? Was the Lord with Joseph? Will God honor the requests that we make in Jesus' name? We are blessed in the name of Christ. And the Bible says that uh, those that bless us will be blessed. So that's just a good principle to remember. There was power in the name of Joseph and his connection with God. Now, I think one of the reasons that Potiphar respected Joseph is Joseph is no doubt in Egypt. If you've even seen any you know, pictures of Egypt, there are statues 
Matter of fact, this is where you get the idea of the colossal statues. Colossus was actually a big statue in Colossae, the Colossus of Rhodes, but the word colossal now, when you think of the Sphinx and the pyramids and the great temples of the gods that they've got in Egypt, and I've been in Cairo, Egypt, and I've been inside the pyramids, and man, even in the time of Joseph, the great pyramids were there. And Joseph lived, oh, 1,700 years before Christ. More than that. Yeah, he, it was probably closer to 1,800 years before Christ. And so Egypt was magnificent during this time. It wasn't piles of sand everywhere and debris. It was, a, it was the most civilized, well-managed city in the world. They had an abundance of crops. It was the center of civilization. And part of the reason for that is the climate there around Cairo is one of the ideal climates in the world for farming and the growth of a civilization. Nomadic civilizations typically don't grow and build big buildings and do a lot of science and education. But when you have a civilization by a river where they can farm and have an excess of food because you can irrigate from the river, they got more spare time for study and the sciences and uh, education and you just see civili civilizations seem to grow like in Mesopotamia by the Euphrates and these other great cities. And so Egypt was blossoming because of that. But a lot of it depended on the river. So Joseph right now, he's in Egypt during its zenith. And God is blessing him. And he's thinking things are looking up. I've been sold as a slave, but at least now I'm just underneath Potiphar in authority. And God is blessing. So now Joseph is like, uh, he's about 27 years old. And he's, a, he's at his uh, peak as a young man. And it says here in verse 7, at the end of verse 6 rather, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. That's going to play into the next part of the story. But I want to pause there. You know, several of the people who are types of Christ in the Bible, it also says they were good looking. David, type of Christ. Good looking. Moses. Well, at least as a baby, it says he was good-looking because they threw the other ones in the river and said, but when they saw he was a good-looking baby. It's always strange the way I read that. They read about this law. You throw the babies in the river and says, but he was a goodly child. Um, he's a type of Christ. And so it says that uh, Joseph, it's because Jesus is beautiful. Jesus is beautiful, friends. Amen? Beautiful Savior. But now the story changes. Verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And in words that cannot be misunderstood, she says, come lie with me. So now we've seen Joseph as a faithful servant. By the way, you know that Jesus is the servant, prophesied in the Old Testament as the servant. You can read in Isaiah 53, sorry, Isaiah 52, verse 13, behold, my servant will deal prudently. He will be exalted and extolled and very high. Several times in the Old Testament, the Messiah was foretold as being the servant. You know, before you can rule, you need to know how to serve. And Jesus came as one of us. And he says, I am among you as one that serves. And he that would be great among you, let him be the servant of all. One of the keys to successful Christianity and successful church is out serving each other. So Joseph is a good servant. Something else we notice about Joseph in his capacity as a servant, it tells us that um, he is a successful servant. He does everything well. Notice, you read in Mark chapter 7, speaking of Jesus, Mark 7, verse 37, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. Everything Joseph touched seemed like it was blessed. What about Jesus? The testimony of the word is he has done all things well. Now, I didn't tell you until now, the name Joseph means adding, adding. Jesus does not take away. Jesus adds to your life. Some people think, I'd like to be a Christian, but I have to give up so much. That is a myth. It does require something to be a Christian. You must give up something to be a Christian. It does cost to be a Christian, but it pays much more than it costs. This is what Jesus said. Christ says in Luke chapter 18, verse 29, Jesus is speaking, Assuredly, I say to you, 
There's no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more, he adds, in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. God adds to us. Jesus said, John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief, he comes except to steal, to kill and destroy. I've come that they might have life. What kind of life? More abundantly. Jesus is an addition to your life. He multiplies blessings. He giveth and giveth and giveth again. Amen? So this is blessings to us. We cannot number them. You read in Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians 3 verse 20, he wants to bless exceedingly, abundantly, above all. So Joseph, Joseph added, and he was faithful in the little things. Now that's another principle we'll see play out. Luke 16, 10, he who is faithful in that which is the least is faithful also in much. So when Joseph was in Potiphar's house and he was sweeping, he did not look to his right and his left, and when no one was looking, he swept the dirt under the carpet. He swept it into the dustpan and took it to the appropriate bin. Joseph was faithful in the little things. And if you're faithful in little things, you then are successful in big things. Little things matter to God. Amen? Amen. But now, it's not Jesus and Joseph as the faithful servant. Now we see him as the innocent scapegoat. Potiphar's wife casts longing eyes on Joseph, this handsome young man, and I don't know what was going on between Mr. Potiphar and Mrs. Potiphar, but uh, evidently she wasn't satisfied. And she set her eyes on Joseph, and this is probably a good place to mention, you know, the verse in the Bible that tells us that uh, it's not only a sin to commit adultery, but a person can commit adultery with a look, typically begins with a look. And it's not only, Jesus said, and if a man looks on a woman, he can commit adultery in his heart. We all know that. Clearly, a woman can look on a man, too. Amen? Amen. And I don't know when I'll get another chance to say this, so I better say it now. We already know that everybody struggles with temptation. Anybody healthy at some point in their life has probably struggled with impure thoughts. Don't make it worse for anybody by dressing in a way that will be provocative. I suspect that Mrs. Potiphar, when Joseph was in the house and her husband was off on business and she had cast longing eyes on Joseph, that uh, she was walking around in skimpy clothes and, and trying to entice him. Uh, don't come to church like that. You shouldn't li look like that any time, in public anyway. You're married, there is a time to look like that. But uh, I just thought I'd remind us, you know, the culture is always telling men and women to try to dress sexy. Should Christians try to dress sexy? Now, friends, I, I think we ought to be neat and clean. We should be attractive in our smile and our appearance. But don't deliberately try to accentuate all the curves uh, so that you make your brother or sister stumble. Amen? You don't hear that very much. And... Uh, well, that's enough. I said enough. <laughs> I made the point. So Mrs. Potiphar turns into Mrs. Pot o' Fire. <laughs> Something happened. And she says, Come on, lie with me. And he said, No. And he flatly refuses. Now, I just feel like we ought to stand up and cheer for Joseph right now. Because everybody likes to talk about the fall of Samson with women and the fall of David with women and the fall of uh, Solomon with many women. And we all like to make excuses, but we forget about people like Joseph, who was victorious. And we forget about people like Job, who said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I behold a, a maid? There are examples in the Bible of people who were successful. Set them before you as examples. Joseph said, no, this is wrong. And he was a healthy young man. He later does get married and have a family. Everything's working. And yet he manages to say no because he knows it's wrong. His mother, during her time of influence, and father impressed him with those truths. Notice what it says here in verse 8. But he refused, praise God, 
And he said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he's committed all that he has to my hand. Another place where he's a type of Christ. Everything done. Jesus made everything. All things that were made were made by him. There was no one greater in his house than I. This is the second time you're going to find that there's no one greater. See, Joseph is the favored, beloved son of the father. Now he's the favorite, he's the favorite slave. Next, you're going to see him portrayed as the favorite prison steward. And finally, he becomes second to the king. Joseph is a type of Christ, and the Christ, he only submits to the authority of the father. At least in his earthly revelation, he always says, the father is greater than I am. So he says, no one's greater than I am. And he's kept not, back nothing for me but you, because you're his wife. How can I then do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now I want to ask you a question. Have the Ten Commandments been spoken yet at this point? No. Have they been written anywhere that we know of? No. Did they know that adultery was a sin back then? When um, Cain was told by God, um, sin lies at the door of your heart and Cain murders his brother. Was murder a sin back in the, right outside the Garden of Eden there? It was. And so people who think the Ten Commandments didn't show up until Exodus 20, they are mistaken. The Bible says, Abraham, who lived before Moses, kept my laws and my statutes, my commandments, my judgments. God has always had his law. And by the way, I might add, Sabbath goes back to the Garden of Eden. All Ten Commandments were there at the very beginning, friends, including adultery. And Joseph said, how can I commit this sin against God? He said, it would be dishonorable to my master. It'd be dishonorable to God. So it was that she spoke to Joseph day by day. How often does temptation come? And day by day. Right now, the devil, sometimes the devil, he appears as a hot fudge Sunday. Sometimes the, the devil, he appears as the wrong job opportunity. Sometimes he appears as someone else's husband or wife. And this was the devil operating through this person. She's a real human. Day by day, how did Joseph respond to temptation? He did not heed her to lie with her, nor to be with her. The Bible says flee temptation. Amen? He tried to stay as far away from Mrs. Potifar as he could. But she was, she was scheming. And it says it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house. He had to go into the house to do his work. And none of the men were in the house. I wonder how that was arranged. She had sent them all away on business. That she caught him by his garment and said, lie with me. But he, now you can just think, let's pause here. What's going on in Joseph's mind? Not only did he uh, realize that, uh, do you know what the name Potiphar means, his boss? Fat bull. Now, I don't know if that says anything about the size of Potiphar. Uh, but um, I may have been a big man, but that's what Potiphar means, fat bull or African bull, one of the two. And uh, he's thinking, look, uh, this is a lose-lose situation. If I try to make her happy and violate my conscience, how long is that going to last? You know those scandals, you think you can keep those things secret? It always unravels. The devil will tempt you into secret sin and then he will broadcast it from the mountaintop. It doesn't work. So he knows this thing is not going to last, especially, you know, in a... He also remembered, I told you this would come back. He remembered in his own family, his older brother tried to have a secret affair with his stepmother, Bilha, Reuben. And that deeply impressed him. That scandal brought a lot of grief to his family and he saw his father's grief. He thought, how can I bring that grief to my heavenly father? He's thinking that if I continue to deny her, life's going to be really difficult. If I give in, Potiphar finds out I'm dead. And just, it's like he's saying, what do I do? And he finally said, Lord, earthly options don't look good. I'm going to trust you and do the right thing. Sometimes you think there's just no way out. You do the right thing. Trust God. And if you suffer for doing good, it is better than suffering for doing wrong. So he refused to be with her. She called him and said, lie with me. 
And he fled and he ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand. Do you notice that Joseph has trouble hanging onto his robe? He left his garment in her hand. He fled outside that she then realizes, oh, he might tell my husband, I've got to set things up so it looks like he started it. Very conniving. There's an adage somewhere, I don't think it's in the Bible, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Should be in the Bible because it's true. And when he refused her final advance, that really hurt. She called to the men of the house and spoke to them saying, see, He's brought into us this Hebrew. You notice they're not called Jews or, he, or Israelites yet because uh, they're still under Abraham the Hebrew. And that's from the people of Eber, the descendants of Eber. To mock us. He came in to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice. Now she says that she calls all the servants in so they'll be witnesses with her when her husband comes home. And it happened when I heard I lifted up my voice and cried out and he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Now this is the second time Joseph's garment is being used to cover someone else's sin. What covers our sin? The Bible calls it the robe of Christ's righteousness. Amen? Amen? Then she spoke to him with these words, saying, The Hebrew servant that you brought to me came into me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and he fled outside. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did after me after this manner, his anger was aroused. Now, I, I don't think Potiphar, I mean, he's been married to this gal for a while, we're assuming, and he must have known she had issues. And he had observed Joseph's faithfulness and integrity for 10 years now. And so when she concocts this story that out of the blue, this faithful servant tried to rape his wife in the house. He was wondering how true it was. If he really believed it, and part of his job was executioner, I think it would have been over for Joseph. But because he was angry, but because he had some lingering doubts, he put him in the dungeon. Maybe he had to save face for his wife and the other servants that heard this, he thought, what's going to happen in our household if I don't stand with my wife on this one? So Joseph becomes the fall guy. He becomes the scapegoat. He becomes the sin bearer. Who bears our sins? Joseph suffers because of her sin. What does a woman represent? Church. Joseph suffers because of the sins of the woman. That sound familiar? Jesus suffered for our sins. And Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And again now, who's in the prison with Joseph? Not the average ragtag poor prisoners, the king's prisoners. Joseph, during his years in prison, is getting more education. Now they've got a lot of time in prison. And uh, he's asking questions and he's learning. So, something to notice. Do you find anywhere where Joseph says anything in his own defense in this story? When Jesus is tried, does he defend himself or is he meek? The Bible tells us in Isaiah 53, verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He faithfully resists temptation, but he says nothing to defend himself. He suffers as an innocent lamb for the sins of others. You know, when I read the story of Joseph, especially this last section, I'm reminded of that great quote from the book Education. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle is to the pole. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Amen. You know, Dwight Moody heard someone challenge him once and say, the world has yet to see what God can do in and through a man who's totally consecrated to him. And Moody said, I want to be that man and, or that woman. God wants 
uh, to do great things through you. Amen. So Joseph is taken and he's put in prison. Where the king's prisoners are. Notice verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. God is with his people even in prison and shows him mercy and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Karen and I recently read, I guess it's been about a year now, I shouldn't say recently, but um, evangelists use prophetic terms, a day is a year. We read this book about a Chinese Christian who was converted and he spent years in prison for his faith and they let him out of prison, he'd go right back to teaching and preaching and they put him back in prison. And he said, you know, God is with me when I'm preaching and God is with me when I'm in prison. And he looked at the story of Joseph and he was encouraged by that. By the way, after years of torture in prison, he's free now in Europe and he's still preaching the gospel. The, the day may come again, friends, when we will be in prison for our faith. It's getting easier to believe, isn't it? As time goes by. And it tells us, and the keeper of the prison says, God gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. Maybe the keeper of the prison talked to the captain of the guard and said, you got this guy, Joseph. He said, seems like a, a sharp young guy. And Potiphar said, man, ever since he left, you know, I had all kinds of problems before he came. He came, God blessed, everything was great. He left, it's all falling apart again. And he said, uh, yeah, God's with him. So the keeper of the prison gives him more responsibility. Made all that he did to prosper. And then it comes to pass that after these things, and I'm probably going to have to hasten along to, to share this aspect of the story, while Joseph's in prison, now we see him, he's a faithful prison steward, and uh, turns out that somebody tried to poison the Pharaoh or something because the Pharaoh was angry and two of his servants, his butler that took care of what the, the Pharaoh drank and was a confidant, you know, Nehemiah was the butler for the king, Ahasuerus, the cupbearer, and the baker responsible for the food that the Pharaoh ate. People were always trying to dispatch kings back then with poison. And so before they ate anything, they had people that they had to trust that took care of the food. Maybe the Pharaoh got sick and said, someone tried to poison me. I don't know if it's what I ate or drank. So he puts the baker and the butler in jail. And while they're in jail, Joseph's taking care of them. They're waiting a trial or something, and they have these vivid dreams. And Joseph gets up one morning and said, what's the problem? He said, We've had these dreams. They seem supernatural, not like an ordinary dream. We don't know what it means. Joseph said, well, tell me your dream. God, God can help answer these. And so the butler said, well, I had this dream that I was squeezing grapes, and I'm summarizing this, squeezing grapes, uh, and there's, you know, these three vines, and I'm squeezing grapes into the, the Pharaoh's cup, and and Joseph said, oh, in three days, you're going to be restored to your position. And he said, when you're restored to your position with the Pharaoh, please appeal for me. I was just kidnapped from my home, and I've done nothing wrong, and I'm languishing here. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, I'll remember you. And the baker said, well, that sounded like a good interpretation. I also had a dream, and I was carrying all these different big foods on my head and the, the ravens, I had three baskets and the ravens came and they ate the food off the baskets and what does my dream mean? And he said, all right, well, sorry, but in three days, your head is going to be lifted up from you and you're going to be hung on a tree. And three days later, the Pharaoh has a birthday and he restores the butler back to his job and the baker, I guess they found out the baker had tried to poison the pharaoh or there was some intrigue. He is killed and hung on a tree. Now, was Jesus on the cross? That was the biggest prison for Christ. I mean, you don't get more in prison than being shackled to a cross. On the cross, he's flanked by two. And one lives and one doesn't. What does Joseph say? Remember me. What does the thief say to Jesus? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's also interesting that the other, the baker who was in prison with Joseph, says that on the Pharaoh's birthday, mentions Pharaoh's birthday, he loses his head. Does the Bible talk about John the Baptist, who's a type of Christ, losing his head on Herod's birthday? Just to find the whole gospel story wrapped up in this. 
And then, now, two years go by, and it says, they remembered not Joseph. But now the Pharaoh has dreams, and he can't sleep. And he has these two vivid dreams, one of seven fat, lusty cows grazing by the Nile, and then in his dream, these seven skinny cows come up. And then he dreams about seven fat grains that come up out of the ground, and full ears, and seven skinny ones come up. And the skinny cows and the skinny ears of grain devour the fat ones, but they don't get any fatter. Pharaoh knows this is a supernatural dream, shakes him awake, comes twice, calls for all his wise men and astrologers to come in and tell him what the dream means. They listen, and they're totally flummoxed by it. They don't know what this means. The butler is listening to all this, and he says to the Pharaoh, if I might comment, uh, Your Highness, this day I remember my faults. I was in prison with a Hebrew, and the baker and I had dreams, and he interpreted our dreams, and it happened exactly as he said. Well, the Pharaoh's desperate for an answer now, and the royal prison's not far away. He said, bring him in. So as now Joseph changes his raiment again. Because you can't go before the king looking like a prisoner. Takes off his rags, and Joseph puts on some clean garments. He comes. Pharaoh says, I hear that you can interpret dreams. And he humbly says, interpretations belong to the Lord, similar to what Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar. And he relates his dream to Joseph. And Joseph said, the Pharaoh is showing you what he's about to do. Those seven skinny cows, or I'm sorry, the seven fat cows, they represent seven years of plenty. And the seven fat ears, seven years of plenty. The dream is given to you twice in the testimony of two witnesses. This truth is established. It's one dream, two different visions. By the way, something for prophecy. God tells us often one truth with different prophecies and pictures. Very important. So, and he says, and then the seven skinny cows and the seven skinny, withered, blighted ears of corn, seven years of famine are coming after the seven years of plenty. God is showing Pharaoh what he's about to do. There's going to be seven years of incredible abundance, seven years of terrible famine. I advise you, you haven't asked, but I advise you to find someone discreet that you can trust, set over the land, set aside during the years of abundance to sustain the country during the years of famine. God is showing Pharaoh that Pharaoh can be a savior. The Pharaoh and all of his wise men and all of his court is listening to this guy and they're looking at him. And the Pharaoh says to Joseph, you don't mind stepping out of the room for just a minute. Tell the butler, he says, what can you tell me about him? He was in charge of the prison. Everything he did prospered. Calls for Potiphar. Says, what can you tell me about him? Well, everything he touched was blessed. And I'm not so sure. I think my wife may have falsely accused him. I think he's a good man. And everyone is so impressed. He brings Joseph back in. He said, inasmuch as God has shown you this, clearly you are spirit-filled. You know what the word Christ means? The anointed with the spirit. So the Pharaoh then says, I'm going to set you over. And now I'm in chapter 41. Joseph changes his raiment. He said, I am going to set you over all of the land. And nothing that is done in all the country will be done without you. Verse 38 of chapter 41. We're going to find somebody like this in whom is the Spirit of God. It says, you will be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. What is the name for Jesus? The word became flesh. Would God that all the church was ruled by his word. Amen? Amen. No one is as wise as you. Jesus is, and the fruit of the Spirit is wisdom as well. All of my people shall be ruled according to your word. Pharaoh said to Joseph, verse 41 of chapter 41, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. He keeps saying all. The Bible says that this is a case regarding Jesus. It says, if all things have been put under Christ in Colossians. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring that was on his hand and gave it to Joseph. He's giving him his authority. 
and he clothed him in garments of fine linen. He's getting new robes again. He goes from the prison to the palace in one day. In one day, Jesus goes from the tomb to the gates of the Father in heaven. There's no more radical change than going from a dead, dark tomb on earth to the glory of angels in heaven. Amen? Amen. Joseph goes from the prison to the palace in one day. And you find this scenario happening many times in the Bible. And he says, I'm going to put you over everything. And I'm going to tell everybody, whatever you do, whatever you want, go to Joseph. You can trust Joseph. Ask Joseph. And it says, Joseph was 30 years old when he went out over the land of Egypt. Jesus came to John the Baptist as he began to be 30 years of age. Friends, do you see it? Or am I just imagining things? Do you see it? That Jesus is a type of Joseph. And now we see Joseph as the Savior. He's getting ready to save. And we've got more to talk about, but uh, the time is, is run out. You know, I, uh, I heard once that Billy Sunday, he went to a uh, town. He was a famous evangelist. Had been a famous baseball star. Gave up a prosperous career in baseball to become a preacher. He was dramatically converted, saved from drinking, and lived out his days as a very great preacher, a very dramatic preacher. And he'd talk about Nebuchadnezzar going crazy. Billy Sunday would get down on all fours and crawl around. And uh, he'd go into a town, he'd want to pray for people. And as he went into this town and he was setting up his tents and getting ready with his group to do this campaign, he had a prayer team, and he sent to the mayor, he said, I'd like to have special prayer for people in your town that need saving. Do you have a list you can send me? And he was surprised when the mayor sent him the area phone book. <laughs> he said, I think you'll find this is an adequate list of the people that need saving. Because we all need a savior. Amen? Amen. Joseph ends up feeding the world the bread of life. Jesus is that bread that comes down from heaven. And he wants to save you.